What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is all about the Slave 1, a Fire Spray 31 class patrol and attack craft that was used by both Django and Boba Fett. Interestingly, it was manufactured by Kuat Driveyards, the same people who made the Venator and Imperial class Star Destroyers. The cost of your standard Fire Spray is unknown, but the Slave 1's modifications gave it an estimated cost of 726,500 credits almost twice the cost of Bosk's ship, the Houndstooth, and 12 times the cost of a TIE Fighter. It was nearly as wide as it is long, with a length of 21.5 meters, or 71 feet, which is more than twice the length of an A-Wing, and at 21.3 meters, or 70 feet wide, it was about a Wookiee wider than an ARC-170. And at a height of 7.8 meters, or 26 feet, it was taller than two AT-RTs. Its top atmospheric speed of 1,000 km per hour, or 621 miles per hour, meant that it was faster than a TIE bomber, but slower than an X-Wing. Its hyperdrive is much more impressive, with a class 1 under Django, and a class 0.7 under Boba, taking it from as fast as an A-Wing, and into the elite circle of ships that actually come close to the Falcon. It always had a great armament, but it differed under each owner. Django's configuration was two twin blaster cannons, two rapid fire laser cannons, one concussion missile launcher, and a mine layer, which usually contained nine seismic charges. As competition between bounty hunters increased, with the rise of violence in the Clone Wars, and in an effort to secure lucrative contracts with the Empire, Boba had to install more and diverse forms of firepower, with two twin rotating blaster cannons, two concussion missile launchers, and a separate two proton torpedo launchers, along with an ion cannon and tractor beam, while retaining some seismic charges as well. This ship had two seats for a pilot and a co-pilot, while also having room for six passengers, along with one force cage that was specially designed to negate the effects of force users. And of course it had a ton of equipment that was dedicated to keeping them off the radar, with cloaking devices, signal decoy systems, and sensor scrambling and jamming equipment. If we take a look inside of this ship, you can see the general layout of the rooms with a ladder that leads down to each level with the personal quarters up top, followed by the cockpit, then a storage area and main hold which contained a swoop bike with the boarding ramp for loading up prisoners here and then the actual detainment area over here followed by this section containing most of the armament. To look at these areas in even more detail, we can check out the cross sections which shows that the weaponry and life support systems were located here. And moving towards the cockpit, we see the weapons control panel, tractor beam generator, and the sensor array, with the hidden ion cannons tucked in here. The pilot's sleeping quarters was just below, and we can better see the prison bunks, which looks like they just held the captives locked to their bed in separate stackable chambers. In the main hold, you'll also see that the seats move into position when the Slave 1 goes into fight mode, but when it was owned by Boba Fett, the artificial gravity projectors would switch orientation depending on if it was docked or when it was in flight mode. And then moving out towards the wings, we see that they contain the repulsor lifts that got it off the ground and which could be used to help with its maneuverability. Beneath all this armor plating, we can see the wide array of sensors followed by the main engines and power generators for the ship. And then continuing down towards the rear of the ship, we see the mine layer magazine, followed by the ion drive, and how the power generator feeds into a waste pump and heat sink that were assisted by this long curving radiator fin. And an interesting part of the cross-sections book for Django says that this hallway was reclaimed by a Corellian Starliner, and it does look a lot like the hallway in a YT-1300. Its history starts off as only one of six prototype fire sprays that were ever produced, and which were used to patrol the prison colony on Uvo-4. Django stole the ship that would become the Slave 1, and destroyed all the other prototypes, causing Kuat Drive Yards to cancel the Fire Spray line, though they would reintroduce it some decades later. Funny enough, it was actually the elevator manager that told Django about this ship, and in this whole event, his previous ship, Chaster's Legacy, was destroyed by the guards. After Django's death on Geonosis, the ship passed on to Boba, and shortly after this it was stolen, but eventually recovered until Dooku had Boba captured by Aura Singh, and the Sith said she could just keep the Slave 1. Once Boba recovered it again, it was his for good, though he would work together with Aura Singh for years, 
even allowing her to continue piloting his ship. At Florum, Ahsoka was able to inflict heavy damage to the ship, while Boba was captured and Singh left for dead in the seemingly destroyed Slave 1. Hondo Onaka would discover this wreck, save Aura Singh, and claim the Slave 1 for himself, painting it red and green and slapping on his symbol. It is unclear how Boba got his ship back, but possibly it was given to him out of respect for Django, and shortly after this he embarked on a mission in which he would cross General Grievous. Grievous almost kills him, but he escapes and was able to attack Wat Tambor's ship, causing Ventress to come to its aid and fire on the Slave One with her Genevex class starfighter. Anakin inadvertently saves Fett, and after pursuing the bounty hunter, the pair landed and decided to trade armor repairs by Boba for Anakin's abilities to repair his ship. In the Imperial era, Darth Vader would call on Fett's service to track Galen Merrick before he took it to Kuat to install all those customizations that we went over earlier. Two months before the Battle of Yavin, Solo was ambushed by Boba, but the smuggler was able to escape through hyperspace. In the year 3 ABY, the Galactic Empire and Jabba the Hutt placed a bounty on Solo, which led to Fett tracking him to Cloud City, and on his way to Tatooine, he was attacked by IG-88C and IG-88D, a battle in which Boba Fett destroyed the final IG-2000 ship. When he escaped the Sarlacc pit, he stole the Hound's Tooth from Bosk, leaving the Slave 1 in atmosphere. Boba then used the Slave 2 for some time, and there was even a Slave 3 and 4, but he eventually salvaged the Slave 1 and restored it to its former glory, before using it in the Yuuzhan Vong invasion. The last times we hear about this ship is in 40 ABY, when a medical droid upon the Slave 1 was unable to save a fellow Mandalorian, Brika Jebin, and a year later he narrowly escaped authorities by using the ship's decoy system to have the Slave 1 appear as a speeder bike on their sensors. So that's it for its history, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. It was widely believed that the design for this ship was based off of the light post outside of ILM Studios, but the art director has claimed that it was instead based off of a radar dish. And of course, over these many years, there have been changes in its depiction in different cross-section books, and in the Clone Wars TV show. So that's it for the Slave 1, but most important of all, remember, no incineration, and the Force will be with you, always.